what you can ask. What an important question to consider today. After me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What a challenging question that can be. Um, that's why I entitled the title of the message, the sermon today, will be The Charge of a Godly Man. So we're going to look at the last part of Joshua. We'll be finishing up Joshua today. So look with me if you would. You have to turn there already to Joshua 24. We're looking at verses 14 through 16. I have to turn there on and tell you a little story about Billy. I don't know anyone here named Billy, so I can use that name. The so Billy had been misbehaving. It was sent to his room. And after a while, he emerged and informed his mother that he had thought it over and then said a prayer. And she said, fine. If you ask God to help you not misbehave, he will help you. Oh, I didn't ask him to help me to not, I didn't ask him to help me not misbehave, said Billy. I asked him to help you put up with me. <laughs> I remember growing up, there were certain things that were expected of me as a child, and I'm sure you all have had the same thing yourselves. Uh, but let me elaborate for a moment. You know, growing up, it is expected that you as a child, you will obey your parents. Oftentimes, uh, if we don't obey our parents, if I didn't obey my parents, I received the right hand of fellowship, but it was to my bottom, right? Not to my hands. I was expected to respect my elders growing up. And when I was given chores, I was expected to, guess what? Do those chores. And so were my friends and their families. I had one friend who lived down the road from me, my best friend growing up, and his family was very structured, very rigid. His father served in the Navy. Um, I never knew the man that I ever had a high and tight hair cut, if you know what I mean. And so every day at 4.30, my friend had to have his chores done. And if he did not, no matter where we were in the community, you could hear his dad yell his name, Ryan, you better get down here and get your chores. I do not know how he could do that, but he could project his voice in a great way. So you see, we had things expected of us growing up. So you know what I'm talking about, man, this, this expectation. But sometimes it wasn't so much an expectation that we had growing up. But really, we were given commands sometimes. We were given... Uh, an imperative, a, a charge to do something, so to speak, for something that we were to do in our life. For instance, I was told as a young man that I better respect women when I grow up, right? That's a command. That's a charge. I was also shown both how to work hard and provide for my family. That was a command. That was a charge. There was one job I had when I was younger where I had to be at morning meetings at 5.45 in the morning. And, and I was just down the road from this job, and oftentimes I would hit the snooze button for just five more minutes. And I didn't ever really end up late. And about my second week into the job, the supervisor looked at me and he said, Travis, meetings at 5.45, not 5.47. Don't let it happen again. And guess what? I never let it happen again. I was never late because I was given a charge. I was given a command. So you see, in life, we are expected to do certain things, and in a great many other occasions, we are told what to do, and sometimes, either way, they're not easy, are they? Sometimes the things we are expected to do, sometimes the things that we are charged to do aren't easy, and you can say, well, why is that? Well, because they're challenging, aren't they? In fact, when we are told what to do, and sometimes it's if we are told that you don't have that in you to do it, so I'm telling you to do that. I'm telling you to, to learn to do those things. Respect your woman when you grow up. Learn to do that now as a young child, right? And other times, God's given us his capacities and we're not using it yet. And the person says, I see that ability in you. I'm challenging you to do that. So today in our text of scripture, we see where Joshua gives a charge to the nation of Israel. He is giving them a challenge. He is one that is, they, if they can meet this, they're going to benefit greatly from it. But if not, then they will fail. It's a challenge that we all would do very well to hear today and be reminded of. So if you would, please stand with me as we read Joshua 24, 14 to 16. Very short verses, but it says a lot. Verse 14 says this. Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Thank you. May be seated. Let's go to the word of prayer. Lord, we pray. 
Father, we are challenged this morning as we finish out Joshua. We are challenged by Joshua who spoke these very same words years ago, thousands of years ago, most likely, with this command, this challenge to us. Serve the Lord. Who will you serve? And so as we think about the entirety of the book of Joshua and the things that we have seen time and time and time again, there is a theme that is prevalent there, Lord. And we're going to draw this theme out today. And I pray, Lord, help me to do that, Lord, as you would have me to. Help me to, to speak the words you want me to say and nothing else. Take the charge of this sermon, Father. Let me just step out of the way. Move hearts and minds as you see fit to do so today, Father. I pray be here amongst us because we're here to serve you. And help us to do so faithfully. And be challenged to do so the rest of the week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So really there are two points I'm going to cover today. Number one, God's call on our lives. God does have a call on your life, whether you realize it or not. And then number two, our choice for the future. So as we consider God's call on our lives, I, I found this little story. It was quite funny. I'll share it with you. It says the three guys are hired at a construction site. And the foreman points out a huge pile of sand. And he says to the first guy, you're in charge of sweeping the sand up. To the second guy, he says, you're in charge of shoveling the sand up. And then to the third guy, you're in charge of supplies. But he then says, now I have to leave for a little while, and I expect you men to have to make a big dent in my pile of sand by the time I get back. So when the foreman returns after being away for a couple of hours, the pile of sand is untouched. None of it has been moved. So he asks the first guy in charge of sweeping, why didn't you sweep up any of it? And he replies, well, I don't have a broom. You said to the other fellow that he was in charge of supplies, but he has disappeared, and I couldn't find him anywhere. So then the foreman turns to the second guy, and he says, And you, I thought I told you to shovel this pile. And he replies, Well, yes, you did at that, but I could not get a shovel. You told the other guy to be in charge of supplies, and I can't find him either. So then the foreman is really angry by that time, and he storms off towards the pile of sand to look for this third guy who has been hidden for so long. And as he gets closer to the pile of sand, the third man leaps out from behind the pile and yells, Supplies! <laughs> You know, I have a hearing that hit me a line there, right? There is a moral to that story. Because the truth is, is that we don't like it when there's a job to do, right? And it doesn't get done. You want to clean your house because company is coming for the weekend. And you have this great agenda of all the things you're going to get done. All of your intentions to do all that. You know, you have the best intentions in the world to get all those things do, done. And yet, what happens is that interruptions always get in the way. And what doesn't get accomplished? Your agenda, right? We've all been there before. Your house doesn't get cleaned. And guys, we know what it's like. We have a project in mind and we're going to work on it. We're going to spend time and maybe it's taking a whole year to do something. And we're like, man, today is the day I'm going to get out there and do it. And then what inevitably happens is that something gets in the way and you're not able to finish your project and you got to wait a little bit more time. You see, it can be very frustrating. You have a goal in mind, something to look at, something to look forward to. And if we could just keep on task and not let these interruptions keep happening, then we'd get those jobs done. And what a great feeling that is when we do that. But what happens when we don't see the work that needs to be done, for instance? What I mean by that is that pile of dirt on the floor that needs to be swept up or that pile of, uh, of stuff in the garage that is meant to be put together that will make something when it's all put together. What if... This is a hypothetical question. What if, without really doing the work in the first place, we just make those things disappear? How would we feel? We'd feel pretty good, wouldn't we? We wouldn't think anything about what needed to be done because we wouldn't see it. Now, I know that we all heard this phrase before of sweeping under the rug. Have you heard that? So let's just sweep it under the rug. And what that implies is that something that should have been dealt with has instead been swept under the rug to keep it out of sight. Now, believe it or not, that phrase comes from the early 1900s when a lazy maid who was given the job of sweeping up the floor, but yet who couldn't be troubled with grabbing a dustpan to sweep up the dirt to get it out of the house. Instead, she would just lift up the rug and sweep it under it. <clears throat> if you don't see it, then you don't know it's there, right? Or wrong. It's still there. It still needs to be dealt with, and until it is, that pile under the rug is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger until one day you have a major problem, yet one that could have been fixed in the first place was just a little old dustpan and a willingness to use it. I had a friend who was a fellow student of mine who lives in Boston, and one day we were discussing this very phenomenon, 
as it relates to the changes that we see in the world today. And I said, well, down here in the South, we have a tendency of sweeping things under the rug because we don't want to deal with them. And she said, oh, up here in Boston, we don't have rugs anymore. We have hardwood floors. And what she meant was is that we can't hide it anymore because it's so bad out there. Their problems have become so big that they have to deal with them. They are forced to deal with them. And unfortunately, we can't hide them anymore either because we must deal with them as well. Glenn says to himself, it's a lot different today than it was 25 years ago. It's likely not going to get any better. In Joshua 23, verses 1 through 2, we learn a very important thing about Joshua. We learn that he is old and he is stricken and aged and that, that he's about to die. So he calls all the leaders, he calls all the judges, he calls all the officers of Israel together because he has one last thing to say to him, to them. And he starts out by reminding them of God's faithfulness in the past. He says this, I am now old and well advanced in years, and you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. For it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. Behold, I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes, those nations that remain, along with all the nations that I have already cut off, from the Jordan to the great sea in the west, the Lord your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight. And you shall possess the land just as the Lord your God promised you. Now it's important to understand what he's saying here. Joshua has lived a very long time, and he reminds the people of the Lord's faithfulness to all that they have done to them in the past. He says, God has done all this stuff for you in the past, and he will continue to do these things for you in the future. And that's a theme that we saw just a few weeks ago, that we can trust God to be faithful in the future because of his past faithfulness. So in other words, we remember the things that he has done, which then gives us hope. And hope is a very important thing. And indeed, God has done some amazing things in all of our lives, as I'm sure that anyone here could tell me of something specific that the Lord has done for them, because he has. So that begs the question for me, then, of do we believe in Jesus because of what we have been told, or rather what we have experienced? For Joshua, he could look back over his life, and I have no doubt vividly remember God's working in his life. And that's why he could remind the people of the same, because as he grew older, he knew that they had experienced God's faithfulness as well. He's been there with them. He's been there with them the whole time. He's experienced God's faithfulness, have you? Now here's the thing that I have to point out next. Sure, sure Joshua could remind the people of God's faithfulness in the past. And, and that's very, a great thing to do about how God has been faithful, but he couldn't do so without also reminding them that God has a standard as well. In other words, his promises are not unconditional. Now, I have to touch briefly on what that means here this morning. Um, I'll give you an example. I'm sure you've always heard the phrase, once saved, always saved. That's, that's prominent in Baptist circles. Once saved, always saved. And yes, that is what the Bible teaches. It's called eternal security. So if everyone ever says the words to you, eternal security, what that means is that once you're saved, you're always saved. And Jesus says in John 10, 28, I will give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So that's eternal security. So my question is this then, is what must you first do before you get that eternal security? you got to get saved, right? you got to confess that Jesus is that you're a sinner and you need him to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior, you ask for forgiveness. That has to happen before you get eternal security. So that is an example of a conditional promise because there is a condition that must be fulfilled before God will grant you that promise. Now, an unconditional promise would be the very much, the, the very much like the one given in Genesis. God said, I will never destroy the world again on the flood, no matter what. He did promise to destroy it with fire, though. That's an unconditional promise. So yes, we have the promise of eternal security, but not until you do something else first. You humble yourself. You submit to who Christ is. That's why Joshua gives the warning then in verses 6 through 13 or chapter 23. He says, Therefore, be very strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right hand nor to the left that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you, or make mention of the names of their gods, or swear by them, or serve them, or bow down to them. But you shall cling to the Lord your God, just as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations, and as for you, no man has been able to stand before you to this day. One man in you puts to flight a thousand, since it is the Lord your God who does this, because he 
He has prom because he's promised you. Be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. For if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and make marriages with them so that you associate with them and they with you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out those nations before you. But they shall be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from off this good ground that the Lord your God has given you. Joshua says, God's promises to you are conditional upon your obedience to him. That's what that means. Because, you see, here's the truth. Christianity is not a free ride. And what I mean by that is that God has a purpose for your life. He has something he wants you to do. In your home life, he has expectations of you, fathers and mothers, as you relate to one another and to your children, to understand that God has a purpose for you and your families. And what that means is that you can't hit the pause button on any of that. You can't, as a dad, say, well, I'm going to hit the pause button and go do what I want and not worry about my kids. Because I promise you this, your kids will grow up very fast and you will miss out on that. And you see, at work, there's things that he wants us to accomplish there for him as well. Even here at church, there is something that God wants of us to do. And I promise you this, it's not the word nothing. God has something for all of us to do. That's why he gives the image of the body. The truth is that the families, they need the church. And the church needs families because nothing will be accomplished without each other. Just like the human body cannot be completely function as it should if one of its parts is missing, God did not design the church to function if one of its parts is missing. It cannot function as well as it can. So we saw just two weeks ago that earlier Joshua had gathered of the people to gather to distribute to them their inheritance. He says, I've done this so you can inherit the land God promised you. And he said that there was still much land to possess for them to enjoy their full inheritance. They just needed to go and take it. We see many instead were seeking peace with the Canaanites. And Joshua knew that. Whom God declared would be overthrown by Israel. But the Israelites didn't want to fight anymore. They wanted to have this they wanted to have the easier way out. And we see that all the time today, don't we? It's called selling for what is second best. Have you ever heard that phrase? Selling for what is second best. Now you see, I want you to imagine something here. I don't have them in my hands. If I did, I would be a very wealthy man. Now imagine that I have a 10 pound block of pure gold in this hand and a five pound block of silver, all right? And Iris, I'm looking at you because I'm going to use another example. What if I came up to Iris today and I said, Iris, you can have this 10 pound block of gold. And by the way, this gold is worth somewhere around $215,000. And so, and two hundred, it's worth a lot of money. Too many zeros on there. And this silver is worth $1,693. So there's quite a difference, right, between these two blocks. I said, Iris, you can have this block of gold if you want it. You just have to do one thing. You've got to work really hard for the next several weeks because I want you to be able to do 50 push-ups without stopping. And you can have it. And if Iris really wanted to get that block of gold, and if it was something that she could do, you see, I wouldn't ask Iris to do something that I knew she couldn't do, right? I, I, was, I know Iris had the capability of doing this. So Iris, if you want to get this block of gold that's worth $215,000, you can have it if you work really hard for the next four weeks and you can do 50 push-ups without stopping. If Iris did that, then she's not selling for second best, is she? But she says, no, 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 I just want the silver. What is she doing? She's selling for second best. Joshua was warning them here to not settle for that which was not God's best because if they did, and we saw the warning there at the end of those verses that I just read, God says, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive them out before you. And there will be a snare and a trap and a whip to your sides and thorns in your eyes, and you will perish from off this good land that God has given you. God will remove his protection from the people. That which they were given power over, they were given power over the Canaanites, they would lose that power and they would begin to get be given power over them. There would be a snare to them, and eventually God would remove them from the land. So the question is this, is do we see the very same thing happen in our country today? Where people settle for what is second best? I think we do. And then God's response is just as he said, don't test me, I will withdraw from you. Why? Because
because God has a purpose for each and every one of us. He has a plan for your life. That's what Paul says in Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we have been created by God. That's what Paul says. We have been brought to the point where we are in this life. And God has what the Bible calls good works for us to do. Things that he wants us to do. Things that he has prepared for us to do. For what purpose, according to Paul? Paul says that we should walk in them. So when you become a child of the king, he's got stuff for you to do, doesn't he? Stuff he's already set up for you. So in a nutshell, what that means is that we have been saved not only to have a home in heaven, but we have things to do for Jesus. <laughs> it's not like an evangelist there going on. Do the work for Jesus. Israel was brought out of Egypt not because of who they were, but because of who God wanted them to be. A small nation, a small group of people, something weak in the eyes of the world because they were the smallest in the world. He had a kingdom of priests to God who he could do mighty things when they were obedient to him. And when they did these works, their acts of obedience would draw others to Christ. That's what we are supposed to do today. Be humble, be obedient, be faithful. We are meant to draw others to Christ by being a light in a very dark world. And when we are, God will work through us using his power to be manifest through us and that light will be seen. It's kind of like this. It's like turning on a bright LED flashlight in a room that's completely dark. When you do that, things change dramatically, don't they? It's not dark any longer. Lives will be changed dramatically when ours does too. When we are willing to let God turn on a light in our lives, it will light up a dark room that's around us. Yet Joshua told the leaders of Israel that if they didn't follow what God has declared to be morally right for their lives, that if somehow they became disobedient in God's covenant promises to them would not be fulfilled in their entirety. So in other words, their light would be darkened. And if you follow the Old Testament history, that's exactly what happened. Joshua, in his own words, if we put it in the English today, would be that you're going to miss out. If you don't trust God to keep his word. I'm afraid today that far too many people miss out on all the blessings that God has for their lives. In fact, when Christians pray today for God to bless them, I cannot help but wonder if they realize that God's blessings on this side of heaven are contingent, are based on our faithfulness to Him in the first place, because they're conditional. So when we put our faith in Christ, believing that He is able to save us from our sins, and we ask for forgiveness of our sins and make Him the Lord of our life, then we can be rest assured that we will never lose our salvation. And it is the greatest blessing that we're going to ever receive. It is the best blessing we could ever receive. But the many other conditional blessings that we can receive in this life are based upon God's moral standards and whether we keep them or not. And when we do, we experience blessing. When we don't, we won't. Point number two is that our choice leads, all this leads to our choice in the future. I was thinking about this the other day. Have you ever known someone who's a really good Italian cook? I mean, the authentic cooks. The little old ladies that when they start cooking, man, the whole neighborhood smells it. You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever known someone like that? <clears throat> you see, I've never known anyone like that, but I have heard that when an Italian woman makes pasta sauce the right way, what I mean is that she doesn't go to food line to buy it off the shelf. What I mean is she makes it the right way, that it takes all day for that sauce to cook. And why? It was because everything in it had to cook down. Everything had to boil down, meaning that all those ingredients need time to blend in that pot under heat to end up with a superb finished product, which is a result of really four things when you think about it. You gotta have the right ingredients, the right amount of heat, the right amount of time to cook, and then you gotta have the right cook to put them all together. You see, God is a master chef, and when you consider all that he has put together in the book of Joshua, that we have been looking at for quite some time. When you boil it all down to one simple message, one overarching theme that we can get from this book, when we get, what we get from this book is very simple. It's a very powerful statement. It's simply this, is that you have a choice. That's it, you have a choice. Nothing else. In Joshua chapter 24, he reminds the people of Israel about their heritage. He, he reminds them that Abraham was on the other side of the river with his fathers and his ancestors and that they worshipped other gods. And he says, but I brought you out. 
He reminds them of Esau and Jacob and all that happened to them. And he brought them out. And he reminds them of Moses and Aaron who went to Egypt and told Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses and Aaron went and God brought the people out. And he did all these wonderful things to them. He brought them to the walls of Jericho. And then the walls of Jericho fell because God said, I will do that when you do these things for me. Over, over and again, God has reminded the people of Israel or their heritage up to this point. And many people, when it comes to their lives, honestly, they don't want to be reminded of their past, do they? They don't want to be reminded of where they came from. And, and, and some do, and that's okay, because they come from a good background. But if you don't have a good background to come from, you oftentimes don't want to be reminded of that. Because some of those things might be shameful. Some of those things might be embarrassing. Israel didn't want to be reminded of where they came from because that would have been a slap to their face. But they needed to be reminded just as we do today. Why? Well, because when you're reminded of where you are, where you were compared to where you are today, you realize that you really had a choice in the matter. Think about it. Abraham didn't have to leave his family and obey God, but he did. Moses and Aaron didn't have to go down into Egypt, but they did. The people of Israel didn't have to leave Egypt, nor did they have to commit to being Yahweh's people in the wilderness. But they did. They didn't have to enter the promised land, fight against Jericho and all those other people. But they did. They didn't have to do any of those things. But they did, which implies that they had a choice. And when they chose poorly, they suffered. Forty years wandering around in the wilderness, watching your loved ones die around you, is a huge price to pay for disobedience. So is watching your fellow soldiers die against a group of soldiers that they shouldn't have, all because you took a piece of clothing, some silver, or some gold, all things that God had commanded that should not be touched. That is a huge price to pay for disobedience. But yet, if we understand truly what God has done for us and why he's done that, if we understand what he's done and why he's done that, then we can truly understand why we have a choice. We have a choice because in so choosing to be obedient to God, we give him honor, we give him glory, and we give him praise because he will do it and through us what we cannot do on our own. And people will see that and they will be drawn to him. And that's a mouthful. What it means is that we'll be a light to others. That's what Joshua could say in Joshua 24, 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away those gods your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your desire to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Joshua, to make it simple, was simply saying this. You know how this works, so either choose God or don't. I imagine at this point that meaning you probably heard a pin drop. The, night, the right ingredients had been added to the pot with the right amount of heat and time, and God was stirring it all together to come to this point, and Joshua says this. He says, basically, choose. And the people did. The rest of the book goes on to say how they said that they would follow the Lord and how Joshua then put up a great big stone as a memorial to their choice that day so that future generations could see the stone and be reminded of the choice that they made. And it makes me question myself and say, what kind of memorials am I leaving behind for my children and grandchildren? What kind of memorials are we leaving for those who are coming after us? What will your neighbors or your friends or your, as I said, your children or grandchildren think about you when you're gone? What kind of, will you leave for them to ponder on? You see, here's the thing about Joshua. His words were not empty words. He had fought against Israel's enemies in the wilderness. If you remember the, the book of Joshua, he led them as a general when they worshiped, when the people of Israel worshiped the golden calf. He chose not to identify with them. When the 12 spies entered the promised land and came back to tell the people that they weren't able to take the promised land, even though God promised that he would give it to them, Joshua and Caleb were the only two who stood together, resting on God's promises that they could. They said, let's go do it. And the people wouldn't. And then when Moses died because of his disobedience to the Lord in the wilderness, he wasn't allowed to see the promised land. Joshua was there, and he knew that Moses died because of his disobedience. And he knew full well that he was going to take the role as leader. So talk about character development, right? He had a lot of it. This was Joshua's character. He chose, he chose, and he kept on choosing because he understood the dynamics of making the right choice. Francis Shaver said this about people who choose. He said that it is something that is required of a person made in the image of God and called to obey. 
because we're not a machine, we're not a robot that doesn't have a will, but we have the ability to choose, and so doing so, we honor God. So what kind of memorials are we leaving behind you today? That's, that's the, the overall question we want to ask ourselves. What kind of memorials are leaving behind you today? Because Joshua, he said these all famous words of his, which is his memorial. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So who will you serve today? Go ahead and bow your heads in a time of invitation. Close your eyes. Lord, it's a mouthful there in the last parts of Joshua. We see those things and we say, what in the world is he talking about? And the simple this is that he's saying, you have a choice. We have a choice. What will we do with that choice? We are not robots. We are not told what we are supposed to do and then forced to do it as against our will. We are given a choice. And in so choosing rightly, we honor God through our faithfulness. But we can't do that if we don't know him as a Lord and Savior. So for someone here today who maybe this has punched them in the gut, hurt their heart a little bit, maybe they've seen their life to say, I've, I've chosen second best and not first. And I need to make that right today. Then I would love to pray for you about how you can know without the shadow of a doubt you can have Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I would, I would meet me at the service. I'll talk to you then. But if you'd like for me to pray for you, raise your hand. I will do so right now. Have that relationship with the Lord, and I hope that you do. But you've taken a whole lot of uh, second best choices in this world, and you've got a whole lot of dirt on your will. There's no time like the present to grab that old dust pan and start cleaning up. It's not going to get any easier. Just watch the news. Today is the day to take that right step. And if I can pray for you on that, help you in that in any way, help, let me know. I'll be glad to do so. Promise you won't have to do some push ups for me. We'll continue the invitation to a time of song. If you feel led to come forward, please do so. I invite you to do so. I hope the words of the song will speak to your heart. Tonight.